Okay, hi everybody. Um, so for this example, um, we're going to practice using the grammar of graphics and mapping data onto specific elements of graphics um, using real-world data um, from um, the BBC's corporate charity. It's called BBC Children in Need. They publish their data regularly, which is really nice for us because we can do stuff with it. Um, because it's real-world data, it's kind of messy. And so um, in the example that's posted online with all of the code, it's a much more streamlined version of what we're going to do right now. Um, but hopefully what you'll see from this example video here is the general process of um, loading in data, cleaning it up, making graphics, finding that you need a new column, going back up um, to the top of the document and um, creating the new column and then going back down to where you were. Um, so you'll see the whole process as we go through it here. So let's go ahead and get started. If you go to um, the example page for today, um, you'll see a link to the um, data from the 360 Giving Project, um, which is this, this organization that collects all bunch of um, data from charities, including BBC Children in Need. And so you could go to their website directly, or I've put it here on the website so you don't have to. So we're going to go ahead and click on that and save it to our computer. Hooray. Um, so now I'm going to make a brand new RStudio project and put the data file in it and get started. Um, at this point, you may have an RStudio project for the entire semester for this class, and that's great. Um, you can just put the same file in the data folder that you have there, or if you want to create a new project, um, you can do that too. So we're going to come to RStudio here. A couple of things to note really quick, something you should always look at whenever you open RStudio, is the console, right underneath the console tab, it shows the working directory, which right now is at this tilde thing here. That's just a shortcut for your home directory um, for both Windows and Mac. And so this isn't actually pointed anywhere useful. Um, you can also look at the project um, area up at the top here, and that shows um, that this is not actually a current project. It's just, it's not pointed at anything. And so we want to um, create a new project so that we don't have this pointing at our main home directory with the like desktop folder and documents folder. Um, so the way you do that in RStudio is you go to File, New Project. We're going to create a new directory. So we're going to click here. Um, hold on, let me get this little fancy icon, uh, the fancy circle around my cursor here so you can see better. Okay, so we're going to click on New Project. This is going to create a brand new directory. We're just going to create it in our desktop. Um, and I will call it Example 3. And we're going to, um, I'm going to, to click on Open a New Session just so you can see that it creates a second RStudio. So we'll click on Create Project. So if you look down here, you can see the first RStudio window that's pointed at our home directory, not pointed at anything useful. And then we have the second RStudio window that is pointed at, if you look right here, it's desktop example three, which is great. That's where we want it. If you look up here, it shows that it's using the, the example three project. And if you look in your files panel, you'll see that nothing is there. Um, it created a brand new folder for us called example three. It has this rproj file that's just a fancy little file that says this is an RStudio project, but nothing's in there. So I'm going to use Finder, and I'm going to go to my desktop, and there is a folder called Example3. So what I'm going to do is take, or I'm going to create a new folder in here. I'll right-click and click on New Folder and make a new folder called Data, just because it's good practice to keep all your data files kind of separate. And then we'll drag that Excel file into our data folder. And we should be ready to go now. So if we come back to our studio, um, and you notice here, oh, sometimes it likes to, um, likes to show old versions of folders here. And so really it shows two data folders, that's fake. If you click on this little icon in the top corner of the files panel, it'll refresh the view. And now there's really just one data file or data folder. So we want that. Then we're going to create an R Markdown file where we're going to do all of our analysis. So if you go to File, New File, R Markdown. Um, again, you don't really need to worry about anything there because um, we can just edit it later. So I'm just going to hit OK. Um, we're going to change the title to um, or 
this is BBC Children in Need. And we'll put my name here. And date doesn't matter, so we'll just get rid of that. Okay, everything else here we can just select all the way to the bottom and delete because we don't need any of that placeholder code. So what we're going to start off doing is loading our libraries first and then loading some data. So we're going to insert a new chunk so that we can start with our R code. So we'll use this menu here to insert an R chunk. You can also press Command Option I or Control Alt I to do the same thing with the keyboard. So we're going to have a chunk here, and this is where we need to load the libraries that we're going to be using. So we're going to use library tidyverse because that has ggplot and dplyr and all of the, the fancy libraries we're using. Um, we also need a special library that comes with tidyverse but doesn't get loaded when you do tidyverse called readxl. And this reads Excel files. Um, because this, this data that we downloaded isn't a CSV file, it's an Excel file, we have to use a special function called read underscore Excel to read it. Um, so that's what we need here. Um, so if we go ahead and click on this play button, it will run the chunk and load those libraries. And it should be fairly invisible. Um, it will show all of these messages and any errors and warnings and stuff. Um, again, I like to turn those off. Um, because I know for this chunk, it's going to create a whole bunch of messages. And so there's no need to have all of that there. So if you click on this gear icon for the chunk, we can turn off the warnings and we can turn off the messages. We can also name this and we'll call it load libraries data. Um, just so that we have, like we remember what this chunk does. And again, that's useful um, for when you have this little table of contents down here you know that like you can skip to chunk one by clicking on chunk one li load libraries data and you know what it is if you don't have a name for it it would just be called chunk one which is less helpful okay so we have those libraries loaded now we want to load our data so we're going to create a new object called bbc underscore raw we can name it whatever we want i typically like to load the data initially and call it something raw and that's like the pristine version that I haven't edited, I haven't mutated, I haven't done anything to it yet. Um, so we'll say BBC raw equals, and again, the, the keyboard shortcut for that backwards arrow thing is option minus or alt minus. Um, I'm currently using a font that magically puts, them to, puts the characters together like that. Let me turn that off. Um, just so you don't get confused. Um, you can download this font. It's called Fira Code. If you Google that, you'll find it. Um, we'll just switch to Consolus here really quick. So you won't see that connected backwards arrow thing. There we go. Now you can see it's two characters, the less than sign and then the minus sign. So we're going to say BBC Raw. I'm going to make it slightly bigger now. It, uh, so we'll use read underscore Excel. And then we want to type the the name of that file, which is in the data folder, slash, and if you hit tab, it will try to auto-complete. And since that's the only thing in there, it'll fill out the whole 360 giving data.xlsx, which is helpful. So go ahead and click on play again to run that whole chunk. Or if you press command shift enter or control shift enter, it will run that whole chunk. And now we have an object called BBC Raw. So if we click on it, we can see there's a whole bunch of columns with um, the ID of the grant that was given, the title of the grant, the description, currency, date, a whole bunch of stuff in here, which is neat. So now we can start doing stuff with it. Um, a couple things that I want to do first, though, is if you notice the column titles here, some of them are simple, like title and description, but others get somewhat complicated, like this plans, dates, colon, start date, and they have spaces in them, amount, space, awarded, and there's parentheses. Um, R technically does not allow spaces and special characters like colons and parentheses as column names. And so what it's doing is it's doing some trickery behind the scenes to allow that to happen. Um, and it makes it really tedious to type stuff when you have kind of spaces in column names. So one thing I often do is I will rename complicated columns to something shorter so I don't have to do R's weird wave of using the columns. So we'll do that here. So after we do BBC raw, we're going to do, we're going to make a new data set or a new data frame called BBC. 
and we're going to have it be equal to BBC raw. But we're going to do some stuff to BBC raw. So we're going to use the dplyr pipe function, this percent greater than percent, um, which you can also type with command shift M or control shift M. And we're going to use the rename function. And here, the way this works is we tell it the new name that we want to give a column, and then we say equals the current name of the column. So we're gonna create a new column called grant amount because we care about the amount of grants. We're gonna be looking at that. And that's going to be equal to, if we start typing grant amount, it should be, oh, it's not called grant amount. It's called amount awarded. So it, it pops up a, a helpful little menu here, which is nice. Um, if you click on it or press tab, you'll notice that it puts amount awarded, but then it uses these back ticks here. Um, having those back ticks around this column name is our way of saying allow spaces inside or allow parentheses inside. And so if you have any spaces, you have to wrap it with this, this back tick thing. Um, that also works like if there were parentheses or colons, it would it would wrap it in this in this back tick thing. Um, but then that gets hard to type, especially when there's lots of text. It could be like a whole sentence. You're not going to want to keep typing that whenever you make plots. And so um, renaming it to just grant underscore amount is a lot easier and quicker to work with. Um, so we're going to do that. Um, we'll also, we're going to work with a couple other columns here. If we look, so we have the, so we have the amount. Um, there's also a, a column here for grant program title. They have two different grant giving programs that the BBC runs. They have main grants, and if we sort this, we can see the other one. They have small grants. Um, those are the two categories they have, and so we can do stuff with those two categories, but I don't want to type uh, backtick grant space program colon title backtick all the time. That's miserable. So within rename, we can also make a column called grant underscore program and have that equal to, if we start typing grant program, it'll find it, grant program title, and you can see the back ticks there. Um, and so now we don't have to worry about typing all of those back ticks because that's great. Um, then one more column that we're going to work with is the duration of the grant or the duration of the program that the grant was given for which is this planned dates, colon, duration, months. It's got a colon, it's got parentheses, it's got spaces. It's a super messy column name. So we're going to rename this to just grant duration, and it should be far simpler. So we're going to say grant duration equals, and then it started with planned dates, duration, months. So it filled out that whole messy column name for us. Um, so now if I run this chunk, it will load the raw data, it will load the BBC, or and then it will clean up the BBC data, and it should have renamed those columns. So now if I click on BBC and we look at the data here, if we scroll over, we should have grant amount. That's nice. Grant duration. And we should have over here grant program. We're set. So we have some columns we can work with, which is great. Um, so a couple other things that we're going to do before we start plotting the data, and this is only because I've looked at the data and I know kind of what's in here. There is a column that shows the date of the grant. Um, it's called award date. Um, what we want to do, though, is it has like the month that the grant was given, or the award date. It has the month, date, and the year that the award was given. All we care about for this example is the year. We just want to know what year was it given. So we want to pull out just this 2015 and just the 2016, and we don't need the, the month and day information. So what we can do is use a special function um, that will extract that year for us automatically. Um, that function doesn't come with R automatically. It comes inside, a fun inside of a library that is called Lubridate because it helps work with dates easier. Um, one thing you'll find with R packages is that they're named like in clever ways often, um, and people will make puns and do all sorts of things with them. So Lubridate is a good example of that. So it gets installed when you install Tidyverse. It's just not one of the packages that automatically gets loaded when you do Tidyverse. So we're going to load the, li the Lubridate library. So if we press Command-Enter or Control-Enter, it will run that line. And now we have access to functions like year. So we're going to make a new column 
called, we're gonna use mutate, and we're gonna call this column grant year. And we're gonna set this equal to the extracted year that we get from that award date column. So the way we do this is the function is called year. And if we open parentheses, we just have to feed it a date and it will spit out the year of that date. So the date here is the award date column. And again, notice the back ticks there um, because it has a space in it. So now if we run this, if you press command enter or control enter, it'll run our BBC cleaning um, or our BBC data frame making code. So if we look at BBC now and scroll all the way to the end, we should have a new column called grant year. And there's our grant year, which is cool. Um, there are only three grants that were in 2015. Everything else is in 2016 and beyond. So what we wanna do just to make our graphs cleaner and nicer is uh, get rid of 2015. Um, that way we're working with just four years. I think it's 16, 17, 18, and 19. Um, and so when we're doing like faceting, we'll have two by two things instead of a three by two or a two by three. Um, and because there's only three values there. So to get rid of 2015, we're gonna do another pipe and we're going to filter and we're only going to select um, rows where the grant year is greater than 2015. So anything 2016 and higher is going to be kept um, is what that lets us do, which is helpful. So now if we run this, we have our BBC data set. And if we look at grant year, it starts at 2016. And you, if you sort by this, you can see the lowest values are 2016, the highest values are 2019. It worked. Okay, so we have somewhat clean data now and we can start making stuff. So we're gonna make some, we're gonna make a histogram here to give some practice with mapping X value or values to the X axis and then showing them in a plot. So I'm gonna add a heading here called histogram. Again, this is not our code. This is just markdown, which is just text. And this pound sign in front of it means um, it's a first level heading. Uh, we could make it a second level heading or third or fourth or fifth, um, but we'll just have our first level heading. And because we're doing that, we have this nice table of contents. And so chunk one is before histogram, and now we can put stuff in chunk two and beyond. So what we wanna do is look at the distribution of grant amounts. We wanna see um, what kind of awards this charity is giving. Are they giving giant awards? Are they giving lots of small awards? Um, so if we look at the, the distribution of their awards, we can see that. So we're gonna insert a new chunk which again, you can go to the insert menu or command alt I or command option I or control alt I. Um, so we're going to make a plot. Um, best practice is to name this chunks. We're just gonna say histogram award, sure. Um, so we're gonna use ggplot. First thing we have to do is tell it what data set to look at. And we want it to look at our BBC data, not BBC raw because that still has all of the, the unnamed columns and it still has 2015 and we haven't extracted the year from it. So we want our BBC. And then we're gonna say mapping equals AES. We're gonna set the aesthetics now. So on the X axis, we want grant amount. We're not gonna set anything on the Y axis because R will automatically figure out the counts um, when we use geom histogram. So then we want to add the geom layer. So we're gonna say geom underscore histogram. And if we just run it by itself, it should show us a plot. There it is. Okay, so we have a histogram of awards. And you'll notice that it has this warning right here. It says it's using 30 bins, pick a better value. All that means is when you do a histogram, it, it figures out kind of how many of the rows fit within specific bins. And then it figures out and, and it puts the count. And so right here, there are like 100-ish grants that are between, uh, that are around 100,000 um, with however big that bin width is. By default, it'll create 30 bins, um, regardless of how spread out your data is or anything like that. That's just kind of a safe default that they choose. But they also always yell at you and say, pick a better bin width. And so your job, whenever you make a histogram, is to pick a good bin width. So inside geom histogram, you can type bin width 
equals, and if you choose something like um, 100,000, that means it's going to make bins for uh, donations from zero or grants from zero to 100,000, and then 200,000 to 300,000, and 300,000 to 400,000. So if we run that now, we should see a really, really chunky histogram. We only see three columns, which doesn't really reveal much about what's actually going on here. Um, so if we shrink this down and we choose something like 500, and we say, let's have a column for every $500 um, level of award, we can try that. It's going to think a while because it's going to have really, really, really skinny um, bars, um, which, again, is not super helpful. It does kind of show that there are lots of grants um, that were at this certain level here. I'm guessing that's 30,000 um, pounds. But that's not very helpful. And so there's no official rule for what you do. You just kind of choose um, different bin widths until it looks good and it shows a good story. This is probably a good amount here, this 10,000 um, pounds. One more thing I like to do with histograms is I like to add a white border to these bars so you can distinguish the bars better. Right now, this is just kind of a blob of dark gray. Um, but if you go to Geom Histogram and after bin width equals whatever, you can say color equals, and then in quotes, white. It will add a thin white bar, or a thin white border around each of the bars. And then that way you can see um, the, the differences between the bars, which I like to do, because um, it helps interpret. Okay, so in this plot, we have mapped a column in our data set, grant amount, to the x-axis of this plot it automatically mapped the count of grant amounts as the y-axis. But those are the only two things that we've mapped on here. We have an x and we have a y. But we have other aesthetics we can work with. We have fill. We could fill each of these colors by something, um, maybe by year. And then that would tell us the distribution um, of the grant amounts across different years. Um, so to do that, what we're going to do is copy all of this code here um, one important thing throughout this whole class is do not feel obligated to hand type all of the code, um, especially when you're working with like incremental plots like this. Um, you can copy and paste from previous things. You can copy and paste from the internet. You can do all sorts of copying and pasting. There's no expectation that you will hand type everything. Um, that's impossible. Nobody does that. So we're going to copy these three lines and come down and add a new chunk. And we're going to, just so that we know what's going on, we're going to make some text here and say, next, let's look at the year and amount. Sure. We'll insert a chunk with the command Alt I or Control Alt I or insert chunk here. We'll name this as histogram year. And we'll paste the code here. We still want the BBC data set. We still want grant amount to be on the x-axis. But now we want to fill by year. So we'll say fill equals year. And we'll leave everything else the same. And when we hit play, it will yell at us because the column is not actually named year. Um, if we go back to the BBC data set, the column that we made is called grant year, not year. So we'll change it and say grant underscore year. And now if we run it, we should get a neat histogram with nothing. So the reason it's not showing anything is kind of a tricky computer science-y type reason. Um, if you look at your environment panel and click on the blue arrow next to BBC, and if we scroll all the way down to grant year, it says that that year column is a number. It's numeric. And so what it's really thinking is that 2016 is a number. And so maybe there's a 2016.1 or a 2016.962. Um, and so it's assuming that's going to be the case. And it can't really, it doesn't know how to fill by that number because there are only four possible numbers, but maybe there are other numbers. And so it doesn't know what to do with it. So what we can do is if we make this grant year, something categorical, make it a categorical variable so it's actually categories of years instead of numbers of years, um, then it will be able to color by year. So to do that, 
if we come back up to our data set where we make it here, we're going to add another mutate line after we filter. And we're going to make a new column, and we'll call it grant year categorical. And we're going to set this. Um, the way you make any column categorical is you use a function called factor. That's R's way of saying categorical. So we're going to say factor grant underscore year. Okay, so now if I run this whole chunk here, it will load the raw data and then it'll again clean our data. But now we should have a new column called grant year categorical. So if we look at our BBC data set and scroll all the way to the end here, now we have grant year, which is numeric, and then we have grant year categorical, which also looks numeric. But if you scroll down in the environment panel, you can see, um, let's make it a little bit bigger, that grant year is still numeric, but this grant categorical is a factor with four levels for those four years. Okay, so if we come back to our, our markdown file, scroll all the way down to our histogram, now, instead of filling by grant year, we're going to fill by grant year categorical, our new column that we made that is categories. And we hit play. And now we should get the histogram colored by those four years. And it stacks them up like this. So that's cool. It's colorful. We've mapped a column in our data set to an aesthetic, to the fill aesthetic which follows the grammar of graphics. The issue here is that it's really kind of uninterpretable because um, it's all stacked. Like, um, which is bigger, 2018's chunk here or 2017's chunk here? I don't know. It's really hard to tell. 2016 obviously had a low amount of whatever small grants they were giving here, but these other years, it's really hard to tell. So mapping um, histogram fills is not always the best solution. Um, because it makes these stacked bars that are really, really hard to see. So what we can do instead is we can still fill, but we want to separate this into subplots. We want to facet by year so that we have one plot for 2016, one for 2017, one for 2018, one for 2019. So if we copy our code here again, this our two lines of ggplot and then the geom histogram, and we come down and add a new chunk and paste it in that chunk, what we're going to do is add one more layer to facet by one of the columns in our data set. So we're going to facet underscore wrap. And we're going to facet by, and the, the syntax for this is you have to use vars, this vars function. And then inside vars is where you type the name of the variable we want to facet by. You can facet by multiple ones. We're just going to do one. And it's going to be grant year categorical. We'll just copy and paste that because I don't want to type it out. So now if I hit play, we should have four little histograms, all colored by the year, um, but separated into separate plots for each of the years, which is really cool. And so we can make better comparisons this way. Um, so we see in 2016, they really didn't make a lot of donations. Um, and in 2019, they didn't make as many. So 2017 and 2018 were kind of their big years, especially for whatever small donations these were. Um, one other thing we can do to this plot here is there's kind of some redundant coding here. We have, it's very clear that this panel is for 2016 and it is red. So having a legend also tell us that red is 2016 is probably not very helpful. So we can actually turn this legend off. Um, the way you turn a legend off or do anything with legendy things is you add a layer called guides. And here we can say we want our fill aesthetic or our fill legend, because it's getting the fill from grant year categorical, we can say fill equals false in all caps. And that will tell ggplot to not add a legend for our fill aesthetic. So now if we hit play and watch it go, now we have a plot with no legend um, because it's not super necessary because it's obvious that the colors match the years here. So now we have a histogram. Um, and we've mapped, again, following the grammar of graphics, we've mapped a column in our data set to the x-axis, and we've mapped another column in our data set to the fill color, and we've mapped a column in our data set to the faceting here. And so now we have a nice plot that we can start working with.
Okay, we're gonna make a couple other types of plots really quick here. We're gonna make some points. We're gonna use geom point to plot some things here. So let's insert a new chunk and scroll down so we can see. So we're gonna say ggplot. We're gonna again use our BBC data set and we're gonna map using the AES function. We're gonna say x equals, we wanna put the year on the x-axis this time. So we're gonna say grant year category. No, categorical is what I called it, right? Grant year categorical, yep. Categorical. And then y equals grant amount. So we want to show the relationship between year and grant amount. Okay, if you've paid attention, there's a slight difference with how I typed this ggplot function from previous ways of typing it. Before, I was saying ggplot and then explicitly saying data equals BBC and mapping equals AES stuff. Um, that's helpful for when you're learning this stuff, then you know that BBC is the data set and here's your mapping. Um, but you don't always have to type these. Um, the very first function or the very first argument that ggplot accept, or expects is the data argument. And the second argument that it expects is the mapping argument. So as long as you do data first and then the mapping, you don't actually need to name them. Um, and so typically when I when I write stuff with ggplot, I will I just write it like this and say, use BBC and then here's your mapping stuff. This is identical to actually writing out mapping equals AES, but we don't have to worry about that. So we're gonna map um, X to the, or the year to the X axis, the amount to the Y axis. And we're gonna show this using geom underscore point. And if we run this chunk, we should see a whole bunch of points. Right now we have some issues with overplotting. Um, these look like solid lines right here. That's because there's just so many dots all overlaid on each other. And so it's really hard to see any trends or anything in there. So one thing we can do to help fix the overplotting is to make these points kind of transparent. Um, so if we come in the geom point and say alpha, that's the argument for transparency. One means um, there's no transparency at all. That's what's showing right now. Everything is solid. Zero means they're completely invisible. Um, so if we, if we do alpha 0 0.1, that means they'll be 10% transparent. So each point is only showing 10% of the gray. And so you see like some of these points out here, they're really hard to see, um, but then they get darker as you get more stacked up on top of them. And so there's kind of, you can start seeing some clusters here in 2017 and 2018 and 2019. Again, probably with those small grants of 30,000 um, pounds. So another thing we can do, instead of having them directly in a line like this, let's go ahead and copy this and make a new chunk down here. We're gonna modify this. So instead of having them all um, stacked on top of each other, we're going to randomly shuffle them a little bit. Um, and this is okay, even though we're kind of falsifying data, because what we're going to be doing is shuffling them within this, within each year. Um, we don't want to shuffle them up and down. We don't want to take whatever value this is, like this point here is 150,000 pounds. We don't want to shuffle it and make it be 140,000 pounds for the sake of fitting it on the graph, because that's falsifying data. But if we move it a little bit over here or a little bit over here, that doesn't really matter because these are all 2017. It's not like values over here are January and values over here are December. It's just the whole thing is 2017. So the way we do that is within geom point, we won't worry about alpha anymore. One of the arguments we can use in geom point is called position. And we can use a special function to change how the dots are positioned. And so one function is called position underscore jitter. So if we just run this with position jitter, it's going to shuffle around all of these points within the years, and it also shuffles them up and down, which we don't want. They're kind of all scattered around now. So what we can do to make it so that none of the points are moving up and down is you can control how much shuffling there is within position jitter. So one of the arguments is called height. And so if we say zero, that means none of the points are going to be moving up and down. Um, so if we look at it now, 
this is an accurate representation of the data. And you can actually see these straight lines here because I'm assuming their small grants program um, has a cap of 30,000 pounds. And so there's a whole bunch of 30,000 pound awards here. And then these are their larger grants. Um, and so you can kind of start seeing that here. If you don't want these strips of points to be so wide, you can actually change that here too. So we can say width equals 0 0.3. See what that does it kind of makes it more narrow. And so if we, we can make it 0 0.1 and look at it, and now we have some fairly narrow strips that's kind of getting harder to see. So we can expand that to like 0 0.7 or something. You don't want it to, nope, that's probably too big because now we can't actually see the difference between 2016 and 2017. They're all overlapping now. So if we change that down to like 0.4, that looks okay, cool. Um, for the sake of making it easier to read, we can also map um, the color. We can color each of these points by our year, so it's easier to read. And so what we can do is up in AES, we can say color equals grant year categorical. And if we run it now, we should have four different colors of points. And we have an, a legend. That legend, again, is kind of redundant because we have the categories here. So we know this whole column here is 2019. We don't really need the legend there. So if we come back up to our code, we can say plus guides, and we're going to say color equals false. We don't need that color legend. So it will go away now. And now we have a beautiful plot with all of the colors there um, showing the grant, the distribution of grants for each of the years, which is kind of cool. Um, so let's go ahead and copy our code here. Instead of coloring by year, because again, that's redundant, we have year mapped onto two parts of this graph now. We have year mapped onto the x-axis, and we have year mapped onto the color. But with the grammar of graphics, because we have all these aesthetics, we can actually map different variables onto different parts of the graph. So instead of mapping um, year on twice, we can leave year as the x-axis, but then we can color by something else, like the size of grant. So if you remember, we have a column in here called grant program that divides the grants between main grants and small grants. So if we color by that column, maybe that will show us why these grants all kind of have this straight line here. Maybe, this, maybe these are the small grants, maybe these are the big grants. We can check that. So let's insert a new chunk. We're going to paste our code from um, this plot here. And we're going to change this rather than say color equals grant year categorical. We want it to say color equals the name of this column, grant program. So we're going to change this to grant underscore program. And if we plot it now, we should only see two colors. And we do. But our legend is turned off, so we can't actually see it very well. So if we come back here and take this guides color equals false off and then get rid of this plus sign from the previous line because that was just trailing in space. So now if I run this, so we have our ggplot and just g on point with jittering and we click play. We should again just have two colors, but now we have a legend that says these red dots are main grants and these turquoise blue-ish dots are small grants. And so that does kind of follow what we had hypothesized before that um, small grants are kind of down in this world. They have a cap of 30,000 um, pounds. Main grants are a lot bigger. And so there, it looks like in 2019, there's a big difference um, between organizations getting kind of a standard grant of like 100,000-ish pounds versus organizations getting 30,000 pounds. There aren't a lot of organizations getting something like 40,000 or 50,000 pounds. There's kind of some disparity in, in grant size there which we can see by uh, plotting it here, which is kind of cool. Um, so another thing we can do, another type of graph we can make is a box plot to kind of show the distribution of these things. So right now we've been kind of talking about averages and assuming the average is somewhere around here and assuming the average is somewhere around here. Um, but that's just because it looks like it's clustered there. But we can get a more formal um, summary statistic for the average there. So we'll make a new heading called box plot. And so if we look in our table of contents, we can see that we're in the box plot section. You can see that I also got lazy with my chunk naming. So we have chunk two was making a histogram for awards. This is the histogram with years. And then I stopped naming the chunks. And so I have no idea what chunk five was. 
So if this was like a real project, I would go back to chunk five and I would name it. And this was the semi-transparent strip plot. And now if I look in my table of contents, it's the semi-transparent strip plot. So best practice is to, to keep naming your chunks and not have them be empty like this because it makes it easier to navigate. But I'm just going to be lazy and stop doing that now. Um, so to make a box plot, what a box plot requires is something in the x-axis, because it's going to make multiple box plots for each of the different categories. And then it needs something on the y-axis, the distribution of the thing that we want to show. Um, conveniently, this is what we've already been doing with our dot plots, with our points. Um, and that's the nice thing about this grammar of graphics. We're, we can use the same aesthetic mappings with x being something, y being something, color being something. And all we have to do is change the geom. So instead of showing geom point, we're going to use geom box plot. Um, so I'm actually just going to copy this code from our fancy strip plot here. And I'm going to come down to the box plot section and paste it. Um, and I'm just going to change geom point to geom box plot. And I'm going to get rid of all of this stuff inside because that's specific to points. Like we can't jitter box plots. So now if we hit play, it should make a box plot. So you can see there are eight different box plots on here. Um, this line in the middle is the median. Um, the edges of the rectangles are the um, 25th percentile and the 75th percentile. And these are outliers that are outside of the interquartile range. Um, again, this is all stuff from like introductory stats classes. We're not going to, there's no expectation you know what all of the parts of the box plots are. It's just a convenient way of, of looking at the distribution of these things. And you can see the medians. So it looks like the median grant amount has been increasing over time from 2016 to 2018. And the median amount of small grants is basically the same at 30,000 pounds. It may have started getting lower in 2019, um, but that's what we can see here. And so we have box plots, um, which is kind of neat. So all we had to do to get the box plot was we left all of the mapping, we left the data, we just changed it from geom point to geom box plot, and it worked. Um, we can also do something called a violin plot. If we add a chunk down here, the only thing we have to change is geom underscore violin. And if we run that, we should get some violin plots, which in this case are fairly useless. What they're technically supposed to show is the distribution of the grant amounts um, flipped sideways and then mirrored. So it makes kind of this violin shape. Um, but the distribution here is so wide, like so wide, and the graph isn't wide enough to show that that it's just kind of a straight line. So that's not the greatest plot, but. Again, all we had to do was change geom box plot to geom violin, and it showed up, um, which is pretty cool. OK, so the last thing we're going to do is you can also um, do more summary statistics. Right now, we just we know what the averages are because the box or the medians are because the box plots show the medians. But if we're interested in like the summary or the counts or other more summary statistics of, of this data set, what we need to do is use some of the functions in dplyr, like group by and summarize, to make kind of pivot table versions of our data. And then we can plot those. So we're going to add a section down here called summarized data. And so here, the typical workflow for summarizing stuff is you're going to add a chunk, and then you're going to make smaller data sets. So if we want to know the average or the average amount given per year, or even the total amount given per year, what we want to do is group by year and then figure out the total amount given for each of those years. And we'll save that as a smaller data set, and then we'll plot that data set. So let's walk through the process here. We're going to say BBC by year. And we're going to have this equal to BBC, but we're going to use the pipe function so we can start adding some um, additional steps in our chain for analyzing this data. So we're going to group by one of the columns in our data set, which is grant year categorical. So what group by does is if, if we just run this chunk by itself, 
we will have a new data set here called BBC by year. And if I click on it, it will look identical to the regular BBC data set. All group by does is it takes the column we gave it, which was year, this last one here, this grant year categorical. And what it does is it takes all of the 2016s and puts them in kind of an invisible data set behind the scenes. And it takes all of the 2017s and puts them in a separate invisible data set. And then 2018 and 2019 and so forth. And so all it's doing is it's kind of holding these invisible smaller data sets, waiting for you to do something with them. And so we're just looking at them here. We can't tell that they're invisible because they're invisible. So it's just these groups behind the scenes waiting for us to do stuff to them. Um, so if we add another pipe and we use summarize, you'll almost always do group by and summarize together because summarize does stuff to the groups. If we don't use group by, it'll summarize the entire data set. And so if we didn't group by and we wanted to get the average, we would just have one, uh, we would have a data set with just one row in the end that has the average in it. Um, but if we're making groups, it's going to make average values for each of the groups that we have. So we're going to summarize and we're going to say, we're just going to get the total amount awarded. So within summarize, the way this works is you type the name of the column you want to create. So we're going to make a new column called total awarded. This can be whatever. It doesn't have to be anything in your data set. It's just a name of something. So we'll say summarize total awarded equals sum of a column in our data set, which was grant amount. So this is going to just um, figure out the total grant amount for each of the years. So if you click on this play button now, if we look at BBC by year now, it only has four rows and two columns. It has a column for the year and it has a column for the total amount awarded in that year. And that's what we've summarized. This is essentially an Excel pivot table um, where we've looked at just the total amount awarded by year, um, which is cool. The nice thing about summarize is you can do multiple summary functions in it. So instead of just total awarded, we can also say average awarded, awarded equals mean grant amount. If we run that chunk and we look at BBC by year, now we have two columns. We have the total awarded and we have the average awarded. Um, if we want to know the total number of awards, um, the shortcut way of doing that, we can make a column called a number. There's a function called n that doesn't take any arguments. All it does is it spits out the number of rows inside the invisible group that you're working with. And so it'll tell you how many rows are in 2016, how many rows are in 2017, etc. So if we hit play now and look at BBC by year, we have total awarded, average awarded, and the number of grants. So only 221 grants in 2016. Um, more than a thousand for these other two years here. Okay, so we have a smaller data set now and we can do stuff with it now. Um, so if we come down and make a new chunk, again, best practice would be to name this thing like clean year BBC something. And then we're gonna plot by year here. So we're gonna make a new graph, ggplot. We want to show the total number of awards given by year. So we want the x-axis to show the year, and we want the y-axis to show the number of awards, which is going to be our column that we named number. So we're going to use the, we're gonna say data equals BBC by year. So instead of looking at the full data set, we're just looking at this tiny data set that we made that only has four rows in it. Um, on the x-axis, we want grant year categorical. So we're going to come here and say ASX equals grant year categorical. On the y-axis, we want number. So we'll say number. Oh, y equals number. And then we want to show this as a column chart or a bar chart. So we'll say geom underscore call. Okay, and so if I run this, it should show us the total number of grants given by year as a column chart. Um, and so you can see kind of the big difference between 2016 and then 2017 and 2018. And so the way we did that, again, was with the grammar of graphics. We have a data set. 
we're mapping a column to the x-axis, we're mapping a column to the y-axis, and then showing it as columns using this geom call here. Um, if we want to show instead of the number of grants, if we want to show the total grant amount, the only thing we have to change is the y-axis. So instead of number, we can say total awarded. So we'll just change number to total awarded. And if we run it, it should still show a column chart, but now we have, um, instead of the count of awards, we have the total number of, or total amount of pounds given. Um, if you notice, these numbers are kind of ugly. It says 6E plus 7. Um, that's just scientific notation. R likes to do that. There are ways of turning that off, and we'll talk about that in the future. Um, what this really means is it's 6, and then you move the decimal point 7 places this way. So we're going to add seven zeros. And so it's six with seven zeros, which is um, the six million or something. I have to see it. Six, one, two, three, one, two, three, and then one more. Oh, it's not six million. It is, go back to here. It's 60 million is seven zeros. So that's what it's showing. Um, so these are tens of millions of, of pounds. So 20 million, 40 million, 60 million. And there are ways of, of fixing that, and we'll show that later. Okay, we could also show average, uh, average awarded here. So all we have to do is whoop, change total awarded to average awarded, and run that, and it there's the average amount, which is pretty steady over time. Um, that first year they had a higher average um, awarded, but that's probably because they didn't give as many. That was only two hundred that year. Um, these others were like a thousand, and so the average probably stabilized over time. Um, so that's showing up nicely. Um, cool. So another thing we can do, um, this is actually bad, is we'll learn in the next session you should never show averages in a bar chart because it's bad. So we'll actually switch this to number again to get the count because it's better that way. So we're going to copy this. We're going to add another variable to our plot here. So, so far we only have two. We have the year and we have the number. But because we're using the grammar of graphics, we can shove other variables into here. So we could divide these um, by the count of small grants and big grants. And so that's one of the columns in our data set. We just have to make sure we have it in our summarized data and then we can start using it. So what we need to do is we need to copy both of these chunks here. So we're going to take this, because right now, BBC by year does not have a column for big grant or small grant. That disappeared once we summarized the data, because we didn't include that as one of the groups. It's gone. So we have no idea how many of these 221 grants were small or big. So what we need to do is make another small data set. So we'll just copy this and come down to our bottom here, and we'll add a chunk and paste it. So we're going to make a small data set called BBC by year size, so we can get grant sizes too. So instead of grouping only by grant year categorical, we also want to group by the, name, the grant program column that shows main grants versus small grants. So what this is going to do behind the scenes grant program is it's going to make invisible groups behind the scenes for small grants in 2016 and main grants in 2016, and then small grants in 2017 and main grants in 2017, et cetera. Um, so we're, end, we're going to end up with eight different groups that it's looking at because there's small and big grants in each of those years. If we leave all of this here, it's still going to calculate the total amount awarded, the average amount awarded, and the number awarded, but it's gonna do it eight times instead of four times. And so if we hit play now, we should see a new data set over here called BBC by year size. And there we go. We have 2016 main grants, we have 2016 small grants, and then we have the numbers. So there are only 31 small grants in 2016. And again, this is just like an Excel pivot table. It's just a code version of it. Now we want to plot that small data set that we just made. So if we come and grab this code here and copy it, and we'll add a new chunk and paste it in here. So the data set that we're going to plot is not BBC by year. It's going to be BBC by year size, because that's the one we want to look at. 
we're going to map year to the x-axis, we're going to map number to the y-axis, but then we want to fill each of these columns by grant size, if they're big or small. So that's this grant program column. So we're going to say fill equals grant program. And now if I hit play, the only thing I had to change again was just telling it to fill by one of the columns. And now you can see that it's filled by it. And now we have two different columns. By default, it stacks the columns on top of each other. And so there's this little sliver of small grants and then big grants on top of it. And so that's how it's showing here. Stacked bar charts are OK. Um, but again, they're kind of hard to interpret, especially when you get into comparing main grants in 2016 to main grants in 2019. Um, because these don't have the same baseline anymore. And so you, what you have to do is figure out, is this rectangle the same size as this one? That one's probably easier to see, but like 2017, 2018, um, that's harder to tell if there's a difference. The blue section, the small grants, that's fairly easy to see the difference because they all have the same baseline there. Um, they don't have an extra chunk sitting up on top that you have to figure out. So what we can do is we can make main grants also start down at zero and have the same baseline. Um, so just like we did with the position, uh, the jittering position that we did before with the points, we can use a different positioning argument to make these, instead of being stacked, we can have them be what is called dodged, which means they're going to be side by side. So in GM call, we can say position equals position dodge. And if now if we run it, we should get some side-by-side -side bars, just like that. So this is easier to compare now because the height, like all of these bars start at zero. So you can compare the tops of all of the bars and see um, what the actual values are a lot easier than when they're stacked. And so that works pretty well. Um, if you don't like dodging, we can do what we did before with histograms and facet. And so instead of having side-by-side -side bars, we can have two subplots. We can have one plot for main grants and one plot for small grants. So to do that, we just have to change a couple of the, of the settings here in our ggplot. So we're going to copy that. We're going to come back down to the bottom of the code and insert a new chunk and paste. So we're still going to plot our BBC by year size. We're still going to fill by grant program. Um, rather than positioning it with dodge, we're going to get rid of that. Um, it would still work with it, but we might as well just take it off because it's not actually going to be dodging. And we're going to add one layer here for faceting. So we're going to facet wrap, and we're going to facet by uh, grant program. And if we run this, now we have one subplot for main grants and one subplot for small grants. Um, this legend here is kind of redundant again because main grants is obviously for this one, small grants is obviously for this one. So we can turn this legend off by using the guides layer. So you can say guides fill equals false. And now if we run it, we should have no guides. There we go. Um, and if we want to, instead of having them side by side like this, we can actually put them in one column instead of one row. And so that's just an argument here in facet wrap. We can say instead of um, having it like this, we can say n call equals one. And so now instead of having side by side plots, we'll have um, one plot on top, one plot on bottom. And so that is how you use the, the grammar of graphics. This is kind of a, a quick example. Let me show you one last thing that we can do. We can save this. This has been fairly dangerous. We haven't saved it once the whole time. So we'll save this as example three. If I knit it now, it's going to knit to HTML. So what it's going to do is open up a brand new R session. And if we look down here, we can watch it. It's going to go through each of the chunks individually and run them. So it's running our histogram award. It's running histogram year. It's running something because I was lazy and didn't name it. There's our semi-transparent strip plot that it's running. And then the rest, I think, are all unnamed. So it's doing stuff. So if we wait just a little bit longer, we should have a final HTML file. And there it is. And it should convert to HTML now. There it is. So here's our BBC Children in Need document um, with all of the graphs in one document, with all of the code making the graphs. 
Um, had we typed paragraphs and stuff in between, um, then we'd actually see the text. We can see some of that. It says, let's look at the year and the mount. Um, so we have all sorts of plots here. So hopefully this gives you kind of a, a taste for how the general process for working with R is. Um, you notice how we kind of copied lots of code and pasted it. We went back up to the beginning to add some columns and then went back down to use those columns. That's totally normal. You just kind of go up and down. Um, it's good practice to knit um, because that starts a brand new environment. You don't have any packages loaded, any data loaded. And so if it doesn't knit for some reason, that's generally a sign that maybe your your chunks are out of order. Like if this BBC section was down below and we were trying to plot stuff before we cleaned it up, it's not going to plot. And so this kind of makes sure that you're doing everything right and that everything runs again. Um, so that was hopefully a helpful example for this. Um, future uh, code throughs like this shouldn't take as long because again, you'll get more used to the process of, of inserting chunks and typing stuff and running them and um, I'll be less chatty as I give you all of the keyboard shortcuts because hopefully you start memorizing those and using them more often. So there we go. The grammar of graphics with code. It's exciting.